Okay. Should uh, be streaming here in just a second. Should uh, be streaming here in just a second. Um, here in just a second. Here in just a second. All right. And just give me one second, please. Let me just make sure we're live. Okay, all right, cool. All right, I'm gonna start now. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Hatim. You're welcome. We appreciate you having uh, um, to deliver this uh, lecture today. Uh, thank you again. And uh, thank you to everybody watching online right now. Um, uh, we appreciate it. And um, yeah, so let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, just to get a few things out of the way. Um, first of all, uh, again, Dr. Hatem, thank you so much for, um, uh, for participating with us and doing uh, this lecture. Uh, it's our pleasure and our honor to have you here virtually. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, also, with everything going on today uh, as well in uh, Beirut, uh, we would like to uh, uh, wish everybody in, in Lebanon, uh, we hope everybody is doing okay over there. Uh, as some of you probably know, there was a major explosion there today and we hope everybody's doing okay and everybody and uh, their families are doing okay. Um, so just to get started today, uh, we're happy to host uh, Dr. Hatem Bazian, uh, who will be delivering uh, this year's Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lectured, uh, Lecture, which is titled From the Oslo Accords to BDS. Uh, topography of Palestine's activism in the U.S. Uh, we were hoping to have this in person, uh, as you know, Dr. Hatem, but uh, of course, uh, with everything going on, we had to do this virtually, uh, but hopefully next time we'll have you in person. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, so in this uh, lecture uh, this year, uh, Dr. Hatem will uh, chart the shift in American public opinion around Palestine. Uh, as Dr. Hatem outlines, the shift is the result of an accumulative process that took shape during the 1980s and early 90s and finds context in several successful national and transnational movements. Uh, as the PLO faced increased uh, regional pressure in the post-Lebanese civil war and the end of the Cold War, uh, the Palestinian diaspora successfully managed to reinvigorate the Palestine Solidarity Movement and stimulate a shift um, in public opinion. Palestinians in the US also played a critical role in the South African anti-apartheid movement, uh, the Central American Solidarity Movement, uh, anti-war mobilization and national efforts uh, to bring about racial and economic justice. Uh, within this context, Dr. Hatem will discuss the pre-Oslo landscape of Palestine activism and the grassroots challenges resulting from the signing of the, uh, of the Oslo Accords that led up to the emergence of a diverse coalition on college campuses and the birth of the BDS movement. Uh, so just a little bit uh, about Dr. Hatem Bazian, who, in case you don't know, uh, he is the co-founder and professor of Islamic law and theology at Zaytuna College, uh, and which is the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in the United States. 
Uh, in addition, uh, Dr. Hatem is a senior lecturer uh, in the departments of Near Eastern and Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, between 2002 and 2007, uh, he also served as an adjunct professor of law at Bolt Hall School of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Hatem also uh, helped co-found uh, the Students for Justice in Palestine on the Berkeley campus in 1992 and worked to promote it on a national level. And in 2005, uh, he also co-founded American Muslims for Palestine. Uh, in 2009, Dr. Hatem uh, founded at Berkeley uh, the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project at the Center for Race and Gender, uh, which is a research unit dedicated to the systematic study of Islam and Muslims. Uh, in 2012, he launched the Islamophobia Studies Journal, uh, which is published biannually through a collaborative effort between the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project of the Center for Race and Gender at the University, uh, University of California, at Berkeley and several academic uh, institutions. Uh, so without further ado, um, we would like to welcome you, Dr. Hatem. Uh, thank you again so much for, um, for delivering our uh, Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture this year. Uh, it's our pleasure and honor to have you here. So thank you again. Thank you and uh, Salaamu Alaikum and uh, welcome to all those who are watching. Um, I would have loved to be with you in person, but considering uh, where we are at with COVID-19 and uh, the difficulties are rising, uh, we're committed to continuing the conversation uh, on Palestine and uh, all the issues related to Palestine. Uh, I do first like to offer my condolences and my prayers and thoughts to our Lebanese brothers and sisters and uh, the community in Beirut, uh, a beautiful city uh, and a country that have hosted and continue to host uh, the Palestinians, uh, refugees as brothers and sisters in the long-term struggle. Uh, to see what have transpired today is a painful uh, to watch and to see the pain that is there. So I wanted to express that. The second, I'm really thankful to the Jerusalem Fund uh, for the invitation to deliver the uh, Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Hisham Sharabi in person a uh, number of times, especially post Oslo, uh, where I had him uh, as a guest of, in the West Coast for a, a speaking tour. Uh, to give analysis and uh, critique at the time uh, of the contours of the Oslo Accord. So and here we're coming almost a full circle after his passing in 2005 to continue the discussion on uh, Oslo and what have uh, actually transpired. I uh, consider Hisham Sharabi, uh, Edward Said, uh, Ibrahim Abu Nugud are uh, really three uh, giants in the uh, landscape of Palestine, academic and intellectual um, uh, really uh, discourse that place Palestine at the hub uh, of uh, acad academia, as well as uh, trying to shift uh, the landscape on uh, the question of Palestine uh, in the face of overwhelming odds. Uh, it, it's not really easy to comprehend the difficulties of speaking and of articulating the question of Palestine uh, in the United States in the 70s and even in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, Sharabi, Edward Said, and Abu Lughud uh, were there in the forefront. So what I want right now is to share my screen with you. Uh, it's much easier to actually speak from a presentation uh, on a PowerPoint, uh, rather than speak and read the text, especially online, it would not be appropriate. So from Oslo, of course, to BES, Topography of Palestine Activism in the US, I see it as a work on progress uh, to look at uh, really the landscape of Palestine activism. Uh, Pre-Oslo landscape, uh, uh, the work on Palestine in the US was structured around PLO factions. 
meaning the various factions that existed with the PLO overseas, uh, saw its mirror images in the uh, type of work that was being done here. Uh, and as such, it was really uh, factional in nature and had its own positive and negatives in the sense. Also villages and towns associations, uh, the different villages and the different associations had their own uh, engagement with Palestine uh, structured around a, a main, maintaining a linkage or a line of relationship to uh, the back home village and the back home uh, towns, and that continues till today, but I'll have something to say about that later, uh, that later on. Also, the General Union of Palestine Students, or GUPS, uh, was present very uh, strongly so across uh, the United States, uh, and actually one of the, uh, the elections, the annual elections or the elections of GUPS was something that was a major event, uh, and the last election actually uh, in 1988. Uh, and after that, uh, actually, the whole chapter of the GUPS nationally was frozen, which had its own uh, consequences. Uh, likewise, the Arab Student Union and associations during the period of Arab nationalism, what we see is that Palestine was a major item on uh, their platform and their organizing. And actually, uh, I actually looked at some of the even late 60s where Arab student associations and Arab student unions were writing statements of solidarity uh, with uh, the civil rights movement activists, with the uh, move toward ethnic studies. And that actually uh, can show that as the 1964-65 Immigration Reform Act brought in uh, Arab and Muslim foreign students, that they immediately link linked up with some of the progressive forces that were present in the United States. Uh, also the uh, Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee that was uh, started in 1980 had a major, major impact uh, and work on uh, Palestine. You could say that ADC platform uh, was very strong on uh, the Palestine front. And for a long period of time, ADC was actually the uh, flag bearer for uh, advocacy and for speaking on Palestine, which is something that changes later on, but we will get to that uh, at another point. Also aid organizations, meaning organization that sponsored particular type of uh, projects, particular type of, uh, uh, of uh, aid to support Palestinian needs uh, on the ground, both inside uh, the uh, inside Palestine uh, but also across the various areas uh, in refugee camps, whether it's in Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria, and other places, and also working with some of the Palestinians in the Gulf uh, to facilitate, in, in particular, academic scholarships and support for Palestinians to uh, study abroad. However, uh, the political uh, work of the Palestinians or the pro-Palestine pro activism was marginal to US political landscape. Uh, meaning that while the United States was heavily uh, invested in supporting Israel and, while, and the Palestinians were very well, very active as well as uh, Arab communities active on the Palestine front, their effect on the uh, larger political landscape in the United States was very marginal, which is something that changes at a later point. Uh, the debates in the United States were framed by the Zionist and the pro-Israel forces, and only we are in a constantly in a reactionary mode uh, and uh, coming into the uh, context of the work after the fact, rather than being uh, at the forefront of changing or uh, effecting the change. So that's just a pre-Oslo landscape uh, in this sense. Uh, the lead up to the Oslo, uh, we had a number of significant uh, development uh, that I would say uh, have put the uh, uh, roots to the current consolidation or the current uh, development that we see in the shift to public opinion. Many try to think that the public opinion shift occur occurred only in the 
most recent, and therefore it's because most recent events. I, my argument is that this was an accumulative process, dialectical, in, dialectical and discursive in nature in terms of how it emerged. And it was a really part and parcel of a host of uh, events, uh, major and uh, movements uh, that lead us to the point that we are in. Uh, foremost is the anti-apartheid movement. And the uh, impact in here is that since Israel decided to actually support uh, the uh, apartheid government, uh, decided to sell weapons in violation of the uh, UN sanctions on the sales of weapons to South Africa, and also domestically in the United States, uh, uh, constantly resisted as well as uh, spied on the anti-apartheid movement. So for those who uh, follow the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, actually uh, spied on the anti-apartheid movement as well as other movements and shared that information uh, with uh, the South African government at the time. Uh, and as such, the, uh, the anti-apartheid movement had a direct connection uh, to uh, Israel and Zionism in the sense that it was uh, rightly considered that Israel was siding with uh, the apartheid government and targeting uh, uh, anti-apartheid activists uh, in the United States and also in other parts uh, of the world. In addition, uh, in here, the relationship between the Palestinian, uh, the PLO, as well as the ANC on the United Nations and in various parts of the world uh, strengthened uh, the relationship in uh, forging uh, this uh, pro-Palestine or Palestinian activi activism in the United States. The anti-apartheid mov movement was simultaneously and uh, met uh, the 1987 uh, Intifada. Uh, some call it the first Intifada, but again, if you're a person that uh, follows Palestinian history, you have to go back all the way to the 20th century from early on to actually count whether it's Intifada or the Arab Revolt and so on. So 1987 Intifada also corresponded to the uh, uh, height of the anti-apartheid movement. And therefore anti-apartheid activists were actually intimately uh, involved in the, org in the organizing and in support of Palestinians uh, here in the United States, especially on college campuses or in progressive cities in San Francisco, LA, New York, Seattle, and other places, Chicago, uh, where uh, anti-apartheid activists and Palestinian activists around the Intifada uh, made it possible to put Palestine on the uh, agenda of progressive forces in the United States. Third, the Central American Solidarity Movement is another point uh, of uh, uh, engagement for Palestine activists. In particular, uh, the activity around El Salvador and the uh, solidarity movement toward El Salvador. And it was not surprising that the uh, FMLN and activists that were, re that were uh, organizing in the United States relative to uh, the Central American solidarity movement uh, actually discovered early on that there is a relationship between Israel and the training that was directed at, uh, uh, in particular, El Salvador, but also other parts of uh, Latin America, whether it's Guatemala, Nicaragua, and so on, where Israel became the uh, subcontractors, in particular Mossad subcontractors for uh, that training. And as such, the narrative, the Palestinian narrative and the Palestinian organizing met Central American Solidarity Movement in exchange of uh, uh, both uh, exchange of narrative, exchanging information and understanding uh, what is taking place. And the work of Jane Hunter in this, in this is very important. Uh, for the Iran, Iraq and Afghan Afghanistan wars, uh, this also resulted not in a particular way of involvement, but the awareness that the shift away from Palestine needed for the activists to begin to think about the larger uh, political goals associated with the Iran-Iraq war and the Afghanistan war, uh, which also resulted in a particular type of consciousness uh, 
to, toward understanding the role of Palestine in critiquing US foreign policy, as well as the regional political landscape in the Arab and Muslim world. The anti-Gulf War mobilization where Palestine became an important issue uh, in the anti-Gulf War mobilization effort where uh, you could not have a rally without actually having a Palestinian spokesperson or a Palestinian uh, number of Palestinians actually speaking in the anti-Gulf War mobilization, even though that there were two separate coalitions that emerged. Uh, one was less hospitable or less embracing of Palestine, but nevertheless, both coalitions uh, had to have a Palestinian presence uh, in the rally against the Gulf War. And I consider this one of the critical shifts that occurs uh, in the social justice movement, the anti-war movement uh, in, during the 1990, 91, 92 period that is very, very critical. To compare it, uh, in the in early 1980s, there were a mobilization for uh, the spring mobilization for jobs, for peace, jobs, and justice. Uh, and there was a debate in the mobilization whether to have a Palestinian stand on the stage with a Palestinian flag, not to speak, but to actually stand on the stage and to carry a Palestinian flag. Move 10 years later, not only that you have a Palestinian uh, with a flag, but you could not have a rally uh, taken place against the war without having not only flags, but Palestinian spokespersons, uh, sometimes the MCs being Palestinians, having including the Debke and so on. So we could see this shift occurring as a result of a cumulative process. And then the social fair, welfare and economic reforms of the Reagan era resulted in connecting the local to the transnational uh, that also give its results in the early 90s lead, in the lead up to the Oslo uh, period. Now, impacts of Oslo, which is very important for us to realize, uh, it decentered the PLO factional organizing. So as the Oslo agreement was signed, uh, the existing uh, uh, organizing that was present in the United States around uh, factions uh, actually completely was decentered. And for a period of time, some actually uh, said not to do anything, that this is a wave and you need to wait until the wave passes, which is in essence uh, rendered them uh, completely uh, outside of the response or organizing that took place. Second, the Palestinian authority became the focal point of uh, the organizing. And that is also was centered around negotiations focus. So all of a sudden, uh, PLO, uh, not PLO, but Palestinian Authority representative who are engaged in negotiations uh, became the focal point of organizing, being invited, discussions, and all the framing was around uh, negotiations and what are the stages, whether it's Cairo 1, Cairo 2, uh, Way River, all the way, this is becomes really, rather than Palestine, it's actually the negotiations are the focus. Third, the impacts of Oslo, it severed the relationships with the younger generation. The older generation was possibly either was born in Palestine or refugee camps and immigrated to the United States, or they were, you know, as they uh, were born in the United States, were directly still connected to the old Palestinian structure from overseas, factional organizing, but in the post Oslo, uh, that relationship, because it decentered the PLO, the younger generation was severed from that infrastructure uh, that was uh, there. Uh, it's also the fourth remove Palestine from communal organizing. So as many of these communal spaces, meaning uh, count villages, organization around villages and towns, that it's no longer was uh, centered on organizing with Palestine. They kept the cultural attachment uh, uh, emphasis, but in essence, it actually removed Palestine from that communal space. Uh, the birth of the Palestine American Congress that was connected to uh, rallying support for the peace process initially, but later on it's actually shifted due to the uh, peace, peace process and the Oslo running into a wall. Uh, 
also impacts of Oslo, the emergence of Islamic organizations, which some can date it to the first uprising, the first intifada, but in reality, they don't come out in uh, organizing on Palestine in the United States until after Oslo agreement in particular. And therefore what we get is an Islamic component to Palestine organizing that occurs post Oslo. Uh, a, negative, uh, a negative element is the emergence of the normalization camp, uh, individuals as well as groups that began to organize uh, uh, around normalizing uh, Zionism and relations with Zionism in Israel, whether it's economic, uh, political, uh, cultural, as well as religious. And therefore what you see is uh, this normalization camp. I remember distinctively, uh, receiving invitation for uh, discussions around joint investments uh, to carry on with uh, our Israeli uh, counterparts that are uh, being part of the building of normalization pattern or to uh, uh, sever or to uh, put uh, impact the psychological barrier of uh, uh, between the people uh, myself, I never accepted such invitation, but there were frequent invitations, whether it's in the economic sphere, econ uh, political sphere, religious spheres, etc. But that actually is a direct outcome of the normalization of the uh, Oslo uh, uh, framework. And it also impacted the Palestinian uh, organizers, especially uh, those who were committed to a centering Palestine in their organizing. And then US, Israel and US attempts at shaping and controlling agenda. So there were a whole host of conferences, of engagements, of encounters, including invitations to activists to come and participate in a state department formatted uh, type of organizing, all with the idea or with the notion of actually extending protection to Israel by pushing or neutralizing uh, effective Palestinian uh, uh, activism in the United States. This is actually post Oslo. I would say it it lasted from 1993, uh, possibly to uh, uh, the early period of post 9/11. So actually, for a period of almost uh, 10 year, 10 plus years, uh, the Palestinian landscape, the activism in the United States, uh, was completely uh, derailed mm -hmm. uh, as a result of this process. And then adding to it the systematic targeting uh, as a result of the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Uh, on this uh, impacts of Oslo, I would like to maybe make a connection and a link, which would become very clear later on. As a result of the, of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, when Iraq invaded Kuwait and uh, the United States deployed its forces, resulting in uh, the uh, pushing Iraq out of Kuwait, uh, a large number of Palestinians were actually e uh, either expelled or removed from Kuwait and other Gulf regions. And there are Palestinians uh, that ended up in the uh, empty quarter, which is the area between Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kuwait. Uh, what a side effect of this is that many Palestinians who used to receive support from Palestinians who were affluent or well off in the Gulf, all of a sudden, that pipeline of Palestinians coming from abroad uh, was impacted and completely uh, in certain areas severed. Uh, in the West Coast, for example, we used to receive uh, on an annual basis a number of students coming either from the West Bank, from the Gaza Strip, from refugee camps in Lebanon, Jordan, other places, and their support, uh, the financial support was coming from Palestinians in the Gulf whether it's family relations or through associations. As a result of the uh, first Gulf War, uh, that pipeline uh, was completely impacted and all of a sudden uh, you actually did not have uh, a, a, a new Palestinians arriving that would actually bring maybe with them a little bit more of uh, concerns and attachment to Palestine due to their circumstances, especially those who arrived from Lebanon and uh, the occupied territories itself. Now, as a result of uh, the Gulf War, 
the post Oslo developments is the emergence of the students for justice in Palestine. And I'm saying this because uh, the connection to the first Gulf War is as a way to, uh, 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 to deal with the uh, uh, lack of Palestinians who were the center of organizing uh, a new idea or the concept of students for justice in Palestine. Anyone that wants to do work for Palestine, uh, as long as they're committed to the principles is welcome. And therefore in 1992 actually uh, initially uh, begins to development and then later on it takes shape across the United States, which is the emergence of Students for Justice in Palestine, first as an idea and a small uh, chapter in Berkeley, but post Oslo uh, and into the post 9-11, it takes a national uh, shape as well as other places in Canada uh, and different places around the world begins to embrace the concept of Students for Justice in Palestine. Younger organizers not connected to all structures. And this is something that we actually uh, possibly uh, uh, can witness that there is a complete disconnect between the old infrastructure of Palestine organizing and the younger uh, organizers and the younger generation, both Palestinians as well as those who are in solidarity with Palestine. There's a whole new form of organizing organizations and individuals uh, that are completely uh, uh, disconnected and uh, really are not part of that old uh, structure. And here I'm not saying old, not in any derogative, but actually as a result of uh, uh, earlier period, especially during the Oslo period, where you have a, almost a 10 plus years of a vacuum of engagement from the old structures, because they were all engaging and rotating around what the Palestinian authority is uh, doing or undertaking, what are the various initiatives relative to uh, the peace process, it resulted in severing that uh, relationship. Furthermore, uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, through its uh, uh, office in DC were actually not connected uh, in any way to the various grassroots on a national level, so much so that there wasn't any uh, material or information that was actually shared on a structural way uh, to many of these uh, uh, individuals and organizations that were uh, e emerging across the country. So that's again uh, is a direct result of post Oslo development. Uh, also Oslo created depoliticizing, depoliticizing of the cultural groups and the towns, the village towns and so on that were really a very, had robust organizing in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, Oslo completely depoliticized them. And because there were certain benefits, uh, economic benefits, political benefits to engage with uh, the Palestinian uh, Authority, uh, it resulted for uh, the depoliticizing of these cultural groups and to actually to the detriment both of their effectiveness as well as uh, the possible support that they would have extended uh, when the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian political structure got stuck uh, in a relation in a one dimensional relationship with the United States and Israel. And that's a separate issue, but we could uh, discuss it possibly in the question and answer period. Emergence of Jewish progressives in the United States uh, in the 70s, 80s, even in the early 90s. Uh, the uh, Jewish progressives were non-existent. There were a number of progressive Jews, uh, individuals, uh, but not in any way in an organizational infrastructure. Liberal Zionism was far more determining the affairs, even in solidarity with Palestinian groups. But the emergence of Jewish progressives in the US uh, actually occurs post Oslo. And we see it's actually its full uh, impact in the present uh, sense and the present landscape uh, that is actually beginning to have an impact, not only in relations to Palestine uh, uh, activism, but also in confronting the uh, mainstream Zionist organizations uh, that have Israel as center, whether it's, uh, whether it's critique of APAC, critique of the ADL, critique of American Jewish uh, Committee, or uh, Zionist, uh, Zionist Organization of America, all these are part of uh, this development that takes place. 
uh, 9-11 impacts and Israel role on, in the war on terrorism. This comes as post Oslo development. And I have another slide that will actually speak about that role. And then lastly, in terms of post Oslo development is the churches adopting Palestine as the cause. Even though that we had historically uh, US-based churches that had relations uh, with Palestine continue to do a uh, humanitarian, but what we see is increasingly churches actually adopting, in particular, the PDS call uh, as the Palestinians uh, initiate the PDS call post-2005. So what we see is the churches having far more uh, actually uh, engagement with Palestine as a cause in a systematic, deliberate way. Uh, Al-Aqsa Intifada, 9-11, Iraq war and attacks on Gaza. Uh, Israel partnership in the war on terrorism has to be understood. Uh, Israel saw this as an opportunity for it to, de to center itself in the war on terrorism. And I think uh, the police training that we hear about, the anti-terrorism training uh, in, uh, that we see in many places, including here in San Francisco Bay Area, Urban Shield, the building of two training towns inside Israel to bring and provide training for US uh, uh, forces before the Iraq invasion. Uh, and uh, to use the uh, methods and approaches that were, uh, uh, that were used during the Jenin uh, uh, campaign by Israel, Israeli military, uh, Israel in essence became a partner in the war on terrorism. Uh, Neoconservative triumphalism, the neoconservatives viewed themselves uh, uh, that, that the West has triumphed post, uh, uh, post Cold War, but really they uh, put their footprint in post 9-11 and Israel was connected into this uh, neoconservative triumphalism and that's and see it as a partnership. Uh, the emergence of a new social justice based coalitions where Palestine was actually uh, a major part of it. Uh, in a sense of no discussions or no debate post 9-11, the Iraq war and the, um, uh, the war on terrorism without actually having Palestine as part of this course. Uh, another element relative to Palestinian organization is professionalizing Palestine access in the United States. Almost every Palestine organization that I know of today is actually have a full staff or at least have a staff uh, members that are paid and are professional, which was not the case in the uh, 80s or the early 90s, whatever staff was there was very thin. And increasingly, this is a result, both as a community uh, reaching maturity, but also understanding what type of work that is needed uh, within uh, activism in the United States. Uh, young generation resistance to war on terrorism connected to Palestine as well. Uh, again, this is a, uh, as people began to organize against the war on terrorism, to, to think about the surveillance infrastructure, the uh, spy infrastructure, all that Palestine was connected to, it, especially uh, since 90% if not more of all of the uh, war on terrorism uh, legal cases targeted Palestinian act, uh, targeted pro-Palestine activists, especially in the Muslim space, but also outside of the Muslim space. So that resulted in the younger generation making this analysis uh, on the grassroots and understanding what is taking place. Uh, Israel and Zionist funding of Islamophobia industry became very uh, apparent and very clear. And I have a whole uh, chapter that, uh, uh, a whole uh, journal article in the American Studies Association on Israel uh, Israeli activists and pro-Israeli activists and Zionist funding of Islamophobia industry as Israel began to connect itself to the war on terrorism, fanning the flame of Islamophobia becomes Israel uh, discourse of last resort as a way to actually center itself uh, in, the, um, in, in the U.S. Uh, political landscape, and I would say uh, failing so, uh, because again, as they fan the flame of Islamophobia, uh, they tend to, they actually, the end result is they isolated themselves or began to be tangential to the social justice movement. And the debate right now, whether actually being Zionist, uh, what does being Zionist means in a social justice movement right now that is committed to, I would say, decolonial framing, uh, ending the war on the indigenous population and committed to anti-black racism. And uh, in essence, uh, Israel as a settler colonial uh, state 
uh, supporting a settler colonial state becomes a very critical piece in this discourse. So Islamophobia becomes an important tool. Uh, in, in addition, targeting Obama, I consider targeting Obama by pro-Israel activists to be a strategic blunder uh, by Israel. Obama, regardless of, uh, of how you uh, feel about his policies, and I have written uh, many about his uh, uh, use of drones, his uh, really um, uh, policies that did not alter much. But in general, the uh, pro-Israel activists that targeted Obama, especially after his Cairo speech, uh, did not understand that Obama represented a new generation of uh, 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 American population and a younger generation, a diverse uh, coalition that he brought to the fourth, and therefore targeting him individually uh, misses the point of understanding the landscape that Obama emerged from. Uh, and this crystallized in Netanyahu's uh, tr trotting into Washington, D.C. Uh, on the invitation of the Republicans to oppose a sitting president uh, policy on Iran. And we're still discussing that uh, uh, agreement with Iran uh, on the nuclear front. But what you need, what we need to at least come to appreciation that Netanyahu began to lose the democratic base, uh, the democratic um, uh, base uh, due to uh, his belligerent and uh, strategically aligning Israel with the Republican vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Obama policy on relations to Iran. Now, I understand that uh, the Democratic Party uh, uh, leadership is still committed to Israel, still dependent on pro-Israel activists and Zionist uh, uh, APAC machinery for uh, their political infrastructure, understanding that, but one has to actually appreciate the shift that takes place in the grassroots and the party membership that is not reflected by the current uh, political leadership of the Democratic Party. And I put this attribution that it is actually the Israeli strategic blunder uh, that Netanyahu took them down uh, uh, this path. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not offering them any, uh, what you call uh, free advice, but one has to at least understand uh, when your counter, when your uh, opponent makes such a strategic blunder, it's just nothing other than analyze it. The last part of this uh, uh, impact is the Gaza's, uh, the attacks on Gaza, the various attacks in the 2012, 2014, and even the earlier one, uh, I actually say that Israel lost the Western public opinion in this, both because they lost the social media and therefore you can no longer actually uh, deploy Israel narrative without being challenged, but increasingly Israel was attempting to function in a unipolar world uh, using only the tools of hard-nosed power without actually having any alternative uh, to its uh, at its disposal or opting not to use uh, those at its disposal. So that shift as a result of these successive Gaza attacks are in essence shifted public opinion uh, relative to Israel. So what I wanted to really to, to think in the current period is not to see the current landscape, whether it's as a result of the protests, uh, George Floyd's protest or Ferguson's uh, protest, to see it isolated from a long history of almost 20 to 30 years of Palestine actually, actually moving in a systematic way to become at the hub of political activism and discourses in the grassroots, uh, at the university college, at the college campuses, and in various arenas, whether uh, in the Democratic Party or even in uh, uh, among certain segments of the religious uh, communities in the United States. I'm very optimistic, I'm very hopeful uh, that these changes are permanent and in my sense, irreversible. And what we need is to think about the next steps that are needed uh, to maintain and continue to build the solidarity uh, to arrive at a free Palestine. So thank you, and I will welcome uh, any questions that you have. Uh, hopefully this was beneficial, and I see it again as a work in progress. So thank you, Dr. Hatim. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have gotten some questions, and 
uh, I think a lot of it really revolves around um, basically how do you see the future of like Palestine activism in the U.S. Um, you know, we've seen some good uh, developments in the past uh, couple of years or so. Um, and then at the same time, we've also had some setbacks uh, with everything going on. So how, how do you see it going on, especially with college campuses, um, um, not just college, but also with the current administration and everything? How do you see it moving forward? Uh, I'm very optimistic on the college campus front. Okay. Uh, the fact that pro-Israel activists are admittedly lost the campuses and they're resorting to uh, using uh, uh, legal and legislative tools to actually muzzle the PDS and the Palestine activists. I see it as an admission on their part that they have lost this battle. And what they are trying is uh, to uh, plug a dam that already have broken by using these uh, either administrative uh, pieces at the university or using legislative means as a way of criminalizing the PDS. Uh, while I know that we're gonna lose a number of battles here and there, but the overarching uh, for me uh, issue is that the war in relations to Palestine is still moving in the right direction. What we need is a number of things for us to work on. Uh, I do think that uh, for us to be focused only on Biden or not Biden is the wrong focus. Uh, Biden is going to be still committed to the old guard of the Democratic Party. And what we need is to actually go down the, uh, uh, the line in relations to the Democratic Party and make sure that we make, a, we make a real shift at the grassroots local level that might translate in the next two cycles uh, of having an impact. So I would see that our work still needs to be done uh, in relations to still pushing for various areas of the Democratic Party. I haven't yet seen uh, what's the result in with the Rashida Tlaib's, uh, but now you actually have voices in Congress that are not hesitant to speak on Palestine and to speak uh, in a very uh, powerful voice on this. And so I see this as part of the whole accumulative process uh, that is taking place. The last thing I want people to think about this, most of, if not all the people that are advocating for Israel on college campuses or that we see are all paid staffs, meaning we're no longer actually having what you call true believers in the cause of Zionism that are committed to the core. Meaning that you're actually having to uh, astroturf advocacy for Israel and for me, that's also another dimension that we need to be aware of relative to Palestine organizing. So these are the areas. What I would ask people is to continue to support the infrastructure of Palestine. For example, Palestine Legal has been very, very important uh, in actually taking on the cases on college campuses. And their reports are very, very important. I know the people that are involved. Yeah, they've, they, they've done an excellent job, yes. Huh? They've done, they've done an excellent job. Excellent job. I know the non, uh, MLFA also have done a great job by taking the cases, especially with the Irvine 11 early on. I know CARE is also engaged. So there is an ADC. So these are important battles to be had. Uh, and it's one front uh, in many fronts relative to Palestine work. I just don't want people to think of instantaneous gratification and instantaneous victory. Right. This is a very slow, methodical process that has to be understood. And you have to take your lumps as you actually gain some of the uh, uh, successes that you're going to be registered moving down the line. OK, uh, we had one question that um, somebody wanted you to um, expand on the Palestinian American Congress. Yes. Um, specifically. Uh, 
if you could expand on that uh, particularly. The Palestinian American Guards, as a way to rally support uh, for Oslo, uh, there is an idea to try to bring some form of uh, buy-in by Palestinians in the United States. And as such, this was a form uh, since the old infrastructure of the PLO was no longer operable, uh, a new form had to be constituted. So the American Palestinian Congress was one way to try to bring this. And for a number of uh, years, uh, they were actually engaged in lending their support to the peace process. But as the peace process failed, their ability to project that type of uh, uh, connection and linkage to the Palestinian in the diaspora became very uh, uh, difficult to maintain. And increasingly, they had to actually shift. So now you actually find them very critical of the peace process, uh, rightly so. And they're trying to re-energize their link to the grassroots and to formulate their positions vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. I, while I'm critiquing these various components of it, uh, these are what you'll call uh, processes that have to be treated, but also to understand how to bring people to different understandings. Uh, I spoke about the ADC. ADC was very, very strong in its pro-Palestine advocacy. But post 9-11, uh, post Oslo and pre 9-11, they actually embraced the peace process uh, under Ziad Asali. They actually were uh, part and parcel of trying to uh, create a normalization pattern, which resulted in the fragmentation of ADC and the split between the West Coast and the East Coast. But now I think they're reconstituting themselves. They have challenges. Uh, Abed Ayub, uh, really a great brother who's doing a lot of good work at ADC. But these are part of the, what you call the long path uh, of Palestinians and pro-Palestinian groups and organizations attempting to locate themselves. If my critique is to be taken seriously, is that we have to find a way to support Palestinians in Palestine without actually making their own infrastructure decisions, political processes to be the determining factor for what do we need to do here in the United States to extend our solidarity. The mistake of the earlier period, which we continue to possibly suffer from it, is that we have structured our organizing to actually mirror or if not to be directed and connected to uh, the infrastructure in Palestine. And I think that was to our detriment. And I think what we need is to learn from it. OK. Um, we also had another question about, um, or just mentioning the, uh, the role of the US uh, churches uh, in terms of supporting the BDS campaign. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? I think the, uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, have taken really a monumental step. A uh, number of the Lutherans also have taken a monumental step in terms of the PDS movement. Uh, work very closely with the Sabir, which is the voice of the Christian Palestinian. They are very monumental. The Quakers uh, uh, have, for a long period of time, had had a strong uh, pro-Palestine and engagement with the Palestinians. So we see that is taking place. I think what we need is to push the Catholics to actually take a stronger uh, position on Palestine. It begins to embrace the boycott divestment uh, section. I know that the Anglican have had a debate and almost a split within the uh, church. Uh, even uh, some of the uh, evangelical uh, Bob Roberts uh, in uh, Texas, he has actually- yeah, yeah, yeah. Has specifically yet embrace BDS in a full sense, but he actually has been very, very strong in his advocacy and engagement with Palestine. So the landscape is actually shifting and the US churches are taking very important steps uh, on embracing the boycott, divestment and sanction, making sure that their own church investments are not located in companies that facilitate or support the uh, occupation in any way, uh, shape, or, uh, or form, but also proactively uh, engaging with Palestinian. I know a number of churches that adopted Palestinian villages, so they have a, a program with villages where they actually send their membership to volunteer and do work. These are all positive uh, pieces. And one for the Palestinian Christians also to understand that the Kairos Declaration uh, 
uh, which is the declaration by the Palestinian churches is very important. Anyone that is engaged in Palestine has to actually read the Cairo's declaration, uh, which was a declaration by the Christian Palestinians. This is a very important element in the overall discussions, not only of the PDS, but also of Palestine. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess uh, just to kind of wrap it up, but I would, I would ask you, um, so uh, just moving forward with everything, you know, and it's uh, especially with uh, the upcoming election, uh, and everything going on. I mean, there's many moving parts here. Um, what do you think is going, uh, I mean, again, we, we, we talked about um, the possibility of, uh, of a Biden presidency, for example, uh, but how, um, how do you see that playing out, uh, whether it's Biden, whether it's another Trump presidency, uh, what do you think is the future in the next few years how do you see it playing out for uh, Palestinian activism uh, and uh, just whether on campuses or whether every, everywhere else? Uh, I do think that uh, if it's Biden's, uh, if Biden becomes president, I don't see it as a, a negative uh, overall. I think it depends on what people do down, uh, down the ballot. Uh, I think we are stuck to think that it's only one uh, one person rather than an infrastructure. So assuming that it's a Biden presidency, the question is what happens with the Congress and what happens with the Senate? How many more uh, progressives uh, will be elected into the upcoming Congress? So are we going to expand our base of support, let's say, from the current uh, you know, 11 con con Congress members, or if you go to 30, depending on how you count it. So is that base gonna expand uh, of the congressional leadership? Also, uh, what will happen with the Senate also has an impact uh, in there. More importantly, I would say that there are pockets around the country that uh, both pro-Palestine activists as well as the social justice movement is making monumental gains, uh, whether it's in New York uh, with the loss of England there, which is a very important election, uh, Ohio, Chicago, uh, Minnesota, uh, even in here, Bay Area, uh, Los Angeles, uh, other places. So what happens at the local level? All politics for me is local. So what we need to begin is what is our ground game relative to the local political landscape? So I'm encouraging people. I know that now maybe the uh, candidacy uh, uh, window is closed, but we need to think of a longer term. You need to run for uh, every open uh, possibility of a seat to contest it, to run for it. The worst thing that could happen is you lose, but uh, losing is actually is part of learning how to win. You put your uh, issues forward. I encourage people to run for library boards uh, I encourage people to run for the various uh, parties, committees, central committees, because these are the ones that determine endorsement. These are the ones that determine the funding priorities and what happens at the regional level, uh, county seats, municipal, municipal seats, uh, city, and uh, all various areas. Uh, so we should not limit ourselves. It's Biden or no Biden, as if Biden is the only center of uh, attention or the only is a powerful seat yes the president but the president at the end of the day has to respond to what the local political landscape in the country is about so yeah. if i'm thinking that this is what i would like to see for us to actually strategize even though that we might lose at the national level we should not actually translate the loss at the national level of any presidency to actually think that we don't have any 
uh, impact at the local level. And that's what I want to see. And then to continue to support the student population, the students, SJPs, the uh, Arab Student Unions or MSAs that are organizing, this is very important because they want to be, uh, they, please, whether it's Canary Mission or other groups, they want to isolate them and they want to treat them in essence in a most Islamophobic way by labeling them as terrorists and supporters of this and this. That's where I think some of our support needs to go, especially from those organizations and individuals that are able to do so to extend the support and make sure that the students have, uh, you have the students back on college campuses nationally. Yeah, and I agree with you actually, um, uh, uh, in terms of your point with the um, uh, more of the localized uh, elections and the localized um, politics. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, we're just trained to think of, oh, it's the presidency and maybe Congress, Senate. Uh, but I think really what people don't realize is that on a local level, that's where the impact actually starts. Um, and I think pe um, people need to be more active with local politics more than anything else. Um, well, uh, for example, yeah. a museum board mm -hmm. that is part of a, a city board uh, remove a, a Palestinian children paint uh, drawing exhibit. Uh -huh. That's a local level. That's a decision making of an elected uh, or appointed board to run a local museum, making a decision to support Israel. So they're supporting Israel and not supporting art. Art of children, right, was deemed to be supportive of terrorism. So again, what we need is to actually have a multi-layered strategy rather than to actually think of the presidency, important as it is, is we need to think in a broader terms and be engaged at every level of political engagement and contestation while understanding that uh, you might not win. And also I'm encouraging people to protest. So for people not to misunderstand me that I'm a person that is just asking you just go back and forth to the Congress or Senate and so on. I want you to protest. I want you to be for you to be in the streets, to make your voice loud. I want you to actually have a boycott the divestment sanction. I want you to have the legal strategy. I want to have legislative strategy. We have to have a full breadth of uh, tools that we are engaging in to bring about change. Change is not only a one dimensional, it's a multi-dimensional. And we could should link, think of the success of the civil rights movement that had a multi-dimensional strategy that got them to where, or the South Africa anti-apartheid movement, they had the protest movement, they had the legal movement, they have the international dimension in the United Nations and so on. So that's how we need to be both nimble creative as well as having a broad scope of what uh, things that we need to do. And lastly, I would say, we should not think of each other as opposing one another, but rather complementary to our strategy. So if you're good at the legal dimension, please go to the legal dimension and work with it. If you are good in the protest, Let's go. But the thing is that how to communicate and to coordinate so we see our each other as complementary to our strategy in con concentric circles of work rather than being seen as opposition. I have all the only I have all the solutions and you don't. That type of understanding has to be set aside as we work for Palestine in the United States. Right. Okay, so just a final question before we wrap up, but um, because we you mentioned uh, South Africa. Um, what, how do you see this, uh, you know, the, the struggle for Palestinian justice and freedom and dignity? Uh, how do you see it uh, in terms of comparing it to the South, uh, South African struggle? Uh, do you think it's more difficult? Do you think, um, I mean, how do you, do you think it's, it's on a similar platform? I, I don't know. Well, each, each struggle has its own uniqueness and specificity. Uh, but if I had to say that there are similarities to what the South African uh, um, circumstances are, and we learned at least from their uh, boycott movement and the anti-apartheid movement very much so, how Palestine uh, circumstances would unfold, it's anybody's guess. Uh, but definitely the two-state solution as a framework is dead. Uh, we are definitely thinking or looking at a one state that is apartheid state right now, and how long that one apartheid state will last 
is subject to both local as regional and international dynamics. I am at the end of the day very hopeful and optimistic uh, that the structure that Israel has in place is no longer sustainable. And I always refuse to be a problem solver for settler colonialism. You built your litter box and I'm not there to clean up your epistemic litter box of settler colonialism. So what we need is to actually go outside of settler colonialism in order to imagine and conceptualize what are the future horizons of Palestine outside of the current settler colonial framing. In this sense, I'm very optimistic because the trajectory actually is demonstrably so that it's untenable for Israel to maintain in the status quo and it has no solution. I know the idea that you speak to scientists, they say, well, there is Palestine, it's called Jordan. I say, ahlan wa sahlan, welcome. So you want me to, you're telling me, you smart person that have a, what you call Harvard uh, degree, and you might be a person that you want five and a half to seven million Palestinians to pick their bag and cross the Jordan uh, River and go to Jordan. Uh, MashaAllah, that's really, really good thinking. So now you have almost 12 million Palestinians, seven, 80% or 90% of Jordan will be Palestinians, are all in this right on the other side. So what kind of solution do you have for that structure where you actually have a whole bunch of people in that? Or do you want to send them to Lebanon? Is Lebanon accepting or Egypt? So all these thinking, what you call is Monday, Zionism Monday morning quarterbacking, thinking that they're still thinking in, they're talking to Cecil Rhodes in the early 1900s. And they're thinking what you call their imaginary, uh, what you call crystal ball of settler colonialism. Uh, and what I say, you know, you need to get up and drink your settler colonialism coffee in order to understand that what you are hoping for and what you're thinking is no longer tenable. And you no longer can wave the Bible because people can read the Bible, interpret it many different ways, and you can't actually work during doing that type of discourse. So in essence, I, I also recommend for that you really need to re-examine yourself. Uh, before you begin to think and write in these nonsense. And anyone who actually looks at Facebook and all these Twitters see that it's really, it's unthinking people beginning to contemplate uh, their wishful dreams of a settler colonial wishful dreams. I would say it's not tenable. And what we need is to imagine what is a decolonial Palestine would look like in the future. I'm very hopeful and optimistic for that. Well, I, uh, I hope that is... Uh... That is the case. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Dr. Hatim, uh, for your great presentation. And thank you again for being here uh, virtually. We would, have loved, we would have loved to have you here in person, but hopefully, next inshallah, time, yeah. inshallah, next time. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. I'm sure our audience also appreciated it. So thank you so much. You're and uh, yeah, so uh, everybody, please, um, we can't do like, uh, you know, applause right now, but we'll do a clap. We'll do a clap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but thanks again, Dr. Hatem, and uh, we'll be uh, in touch and hopefully we can have you here in person soon. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you. Take care. You too. Have a, thank you.